Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Read Aloud. I hope you are all having a great day, that you're enjoying the weather, and that you guys are staying hydrated and being kind to one another. We are reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and it has been a very interesting and good book so far. Lots going on. This chamber is open. Everyone knows it's open. It's open because of the air of Slytherin and we haven't figured out who that is yet. So we're gonna keep reading and try to figure out what's going on next. Of course, Ron, Hermione and Harry are up to something to try to figure out what's going on. If you have the book and you're following along, we're gonna start off on chapter 12, which is on page 205. If you don't have the book and you're just here to listen, no worries, sit back, relax and enjoy. Chapter 12, The Polyjuice Potion. They stepped off the stone staircase at the top and Professor McGonagall rapped on, rapped on the door. It opened slightly and they entered. Professor McGonagall told Harry to wait and left him there alone. Harry looked around. One thing was certain, all of the teacher's offices Harry had visited so far this year, Dumbledore's was by far the most interesting. If he hadn't been scared out of his wits that he was about to be thrown out of school, he would have been very pleased to have a chance to look around it. It was a large and beautiful circular room full of funny little noises. A number of curious silver instruments stood on spindle leg tables, wearing and emitting little puffs of smoke. The walls were covered with portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses, all of whom were snoozing gently in their frames. There was also an enormous claw-footed desk and sitting on a shelf behind it, a shabby, tattered wizard's hat, the sorting hat. Harry hesitated. He cast a weary eye around the sleeping witches and wizards on the walls. Surely he couldn't hurt, surely it couldn't hurt if he took the hat down and tried it on again, just to see, just to make sure it had put him in the right house. He walked quietly around the desk, lifted the hat from its shelf, and lowered it slowly onto his head. It was much too large and slipped down over his eyes, just as it had done the last time he put it on. Harry stared at the black inside of the hat, waiting. Then a small voice in his ear said, be in your bonnet, Harry Potter. Er, yes, he, Harry muttered. Er, sorry to bother you. I wanted to ask. You've been wondering whether I put you in the right house, said the hat smartly. Yes, you were particularly difficult to place. But I stand by what I said before. Harry's heart leapt. You would have done well in Slytherin. Harry's stomach plummeted. He grabbed the point of the hat and pulled it off. It hung uh, limply in his hand, grubby and faded. Harry pushed it back onto his shelf, feeling sick. You're wrong, he said out loud to the still and silent hat. It didn't move. Harry backed away, watching it. Then a strange gagging noise behind him made him wheel around. He wasn't alone after all. Standing on a golden perch behind the door was a decrepit looking bird that resembled a half plucked turkey. Harry stared at it and the bird looked blaf playfully back, making its gagging noise again. Harry thought it looked very ill. Its eyes were dull and even as Harry watched, a couple more feathers fell out of its tail. Harry was just thinking that all he needed was for Dumbledore's pet bird to die while he was alone in the office with it, when the bird burst into flames. Harry yelled in shock and back Harry yelled in shock and backed away into the desk. He looked feverish, feverishly around in case there was a glass of water somewhere but couldn't see one. The bird, meanwhile, had become a fireball. It gave out, it gave one loud shriek. And the next second, there was nothing but a smoldering pile of ash on the floor. The office door opened. Dumbledore came in, looking very somber. Professor Harry gasped, your bird. I couldn't do anything. He just caught fire. To Harry's astonishment, Dumbledore smiled. About time, too, he said. He's been looking dreadful for days. I've been telling him to get a move on. He chuckled at the stunned look on Harry's face. Fox is a phoenix, Harry. Phoenixes burst into flame when it's time for them to die and be reborn from the ashes. Watch him. Harry looked down in time to see a tiny wrinkled newborn bird poke its head out of the ashes. It was quite as ugly as the old one. It's a shame you had to see him on a burning day, said Dumbledore, seating himself behind his desk. He's really very handsome most of the time. Wonderful red and gold plumage. 
Fascinating creatures, phoenixes. They can carry immensely heavy loads. Their tears have healing powers and they make highly faithful pets. In the shock of foxes catching fire, Harry had forgotten what he was there for, but it all came back to him as Dumbledore settled himself in the high chair behind the desk and fixed Harry with his penetrating light blue stare. Before Dumbledore could speak another word, however, the, off the door of the office flew open with an almighty bang and Hagrid burst in, a wild look in his eyes. His baklava perched on top of his saggy black head and the dead rooster still swinging from his hand. It wasn't Harry, Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid urgently. I was talking to her seconds. Uh, I was talking to him seconds before that kid was found. He never had time, sir. Dumbledore tried to say something, but Hagrid went ranting on, leaving the rooster again in his ag uh, agitation, sending feathers everywhere. It can't have been him. I swear it in front of the Ministry of Magic if I have to. Hagrid, I... You've got the wrong boy, sir. I know, Harry never... Hagrid, said Dumbledore loudly. I do not think that Harry attacked those people. Oh, said Hagrid, the rooster falling limply at his side. Right, I'll wait outside then, headmaster. And he stomped out looking embarrassed. You don't think it was me, professor? Harry repeated, hopefully, as Dumbledore brushed rooster feathers off his desk. No, Harry, I don't, said Dumbledore, th though his face was somber again, but I still want to talk to you. Harry waited nervously while Dumbledore uh, considered him the tips of his long fingers together. I must ask you, Harry, whether there is anything you'd like to tell me, he said gently, anything at all. Harry didn't know what to say. He thought of Malfoy shouting, you'll be next, mudbloods, and of the polyjuice potion simmering away in moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Then he thought of the disembodied voice he had heard twice and remembered what Ron had said. Hearing voices no one else can hear isn't a good sign, even in the wizarding world. He thought, too, about what everyone was saying about him and his growing dread that he was somehow connected with Salazar Slytherin. No, said Harry, there isn't anything, Professor. I, uh, the double attack on Justin and nearly headless Nick turned what had Hithrow been nervousness into full panic. Curiously, it was nearly headless Nick's fate that seemed to worry people most. What could possibly do that to a ghost? People asked each other. What terrible power could harm who was already dead? There was almost the same key to book seats on the Hogwarts Express so the students could go home for Christmas. At this rate, we'll be the only ones left, Ron told Terry and Hermione. Us, Malfoy, Crape, and Goyle. What a jolly holiday it's going to be. Crape and Goyle, who always did whatever Malfoy did, had signed up to stay over the holidays too. But Harry was glad that most people were leaving. He was tired of people skirting around him in the corridors as though he were about to sprout fangs or spit poison. Tired of all the muttering, pointing, and hissing as he passed. Fred and George, however, found all this very funny. They went out of their way to march ahead of Harry down the corridor, shouting, make way for the heir of Slytherin, seriously evil wizard coming through. Percy was deeply disapproving of this behavior. It is not a laughing matter of this. Uh, it is not a laughing matter, he said coldly. Oh, get out of the way, Percy, said Fred. Harry's in a hurry. Yeah, he's off to the Chamber of Secrets for a cup of tea with his famed servant, said George uh, shortly. Ginny didn't find it amusing either. Oh, don't, she wailed every time Fred and asked Harry loudly who he was planning to attack next or when George pretended to ward Harry off with a large clove of garlic when they met. <coughs> Harry didn't mind. It made him feel better that Fred and George, at least, though the idea of his being Slytherin's heir was quite ludicrous. But their antics seemed to be aggravating Draco and Malfoy, who looked increasingly sour each time he saw them at it. It's because he's bursting to say it's really him, said Ron knowingly. You know how he hates anyone beating him at anything, and you're getting all the credit for his dirty work. Not for long, said Hermione in a satisfied tone. The polyjuice potion's nearly ready. We'll be getting the truth out of him any day now. At last, the term ended and a silence deep as the snow on the grounds descended on the castle. Harry found it peaceful rather than gloomy 
and enjoyed the fact that he, Hermione, and the Weasleys had the run of Gryffindor Tower, which meant they could play exploding snap loudly without bothering anyone and practice dueling in private. Fred, George, and Ginny had chosen to stay at school rather than visit Bill in Egypt with Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. Percy, who was disapproved of what he termed their childish behavior, didn't spend much time in the Gryffindor common room. He had already told them pompously that he was only staying over Christmas because it was his duty as a perfect to support the teachers during their trou this troubled time. Christmas morning dawned cold and white. Harry and Ron, the ones left in their dormitory, were woken very early by Hermione, who burst in fully dressed and carrying presents for both of them. Wake up, she said loudly, pulling back the curtains in, at the window. Hermione, you're not supposed to be in here, said Ron, shielding his eyes against the light. Merry Christmas to you too, said Hermione, throwing him his present. I've been up for nearly an hour, adding more lace wings to the potion. It's ready. Harry sat up, suddenly wide awake. Are you sure? Positive, said Hermione, shifting Scavers the rat so that she could sit down on the end of Ron's four-poster. If we're going to do it, I say it should be tonight. At that moment, Hedwig swooped in the room, carrying a very small package in her beak. Hello, said Harry happily as she landed on his bed. Are you speaking to me again? She nibbled his ear in an, infect in a, in an infectionate sort of way, which was a far better present than the one that she had brought him, which turned out to be from the Dursleys. They had sent Harry a toothpick and a note telling him to find out whether he'd be able to stay at Hogwarts for summer vacation too. The rest of Harry's Christmas presents were far more satisfactory. Hagrid had sent him a large tin of turquoise tur tur toffee, which Harry uh, decided to soften by the fire before eating. Ron had given him a book called Flying with Cannons, a book of interesting facts about his favorite Quidditch team. And Hermione had bought him a luxury eagle feather quill. Harry opened the last present to find a new hand knitted sweater from Mrs. Weasley and a large plum cake. He read her card with a fresh surge of guilt, thinking about Mr. Weasley's car, which hadn't been seen since its crash with the Whomping Willow, and the bout of rule breaking he and Ron were planning next. None, uh, no one, not even someone dreading taking the polyjuice, um, no one, not even someone dreading taking polyjuice potion later could fail to enjoy Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. The Great Hall looked magnificent. Not only were there a dozen frost-covered Christmas trees and thick streamers of holly and mistletoe crisscrossing the ceiling, but enchanted snow was falling, warm and dry from the ceiling. Dumbledore led them in a few of his favorite carols, Hagrid booming more and more loudly with every goblet of eggnog he, cons eggnog he consumed. Percy, who hadn't noticed that Fred had bewitched his perfect badge so that now it read Pinhead kept asking them all what they were snickering at. Harry didn't even care that Draco, Dracoy Malfoy was making loud, snide remarks about his new sweater from the Slytherin table. With a bit of luck, Malfoy would be getting his compuance in a few hours' time. Harry and Ron had barely finished their third helpings of Christmas pudding when Hermione ushered them out of the hall to finalize their plans for the evening. We still need a bit of people's change. Uh, we still need a bit of the people you're changing into," said Hermione, matter of factly, as though she were sending them to the supermarket for laundry, laundry detergent. And obviously, it'll be best if you can get something of Crape and Goyles. They're Malfoy's best friends. He'll tell them anything. And we also need to make sure the real Crape and Goyle can't burst in on us while we're interrogating him. I've got it all worked out, she went on smoothly, ignoring Harry and Ron's stupefied faces. She held up two plum chocolate cakes. I filled these with a simple sleeping draw. All you have to do is make sure Crepe and Joy will find them. You know how greedy they are. They're bound to eat them. Once they're asleep, pull out a few of their hairs and hide them in a broom closet. Harry and Ron looked increasingly, uh, incredulously at each other. Hermione, I don't think... That could go seriously wrong. But Hermione had a steely glint in her eye, not unlike the one Professor McGonagall sometimes had. The potion will be useless without Crape and Goyle's hair, she said sternly. You do want to investigate, investigate Malfoy, don't you? Oh, all right, all right, said Harry. But what about you? Whose hair are you ripping out? 
I've already got mine, said Hermione brightly, pulling in a tiny bottle of her pocket and showing them the single hair inside it. Remember Millicent Bolstroyd wrestling with me at the dueling club? She left this on my robes when she was uh, trying to strangle me and she's gone home for Christmas. So I'll just have to tell the Slytherins I've decided to come back. When Hermione had bustled off to check on the polyjuice potion again, Ron turned to Harry with a doom laden expression. Have you ever heard of a plan where so many things could go wrong? But to Harry and Ron's utter amazement, stage, of, stage one of the operation went just as smoothly as Hermione said. They lurked in the deserted entrance hall after Christmas tea, waiting for Crape and Goyle, who had remained alone at the Slytherin table, shoveling down fourth helpings of trifle. Harry had perched the chocolate cakes on the end of the banisters. When they spotted Crape and Goyle coming out of the Great Hall, Harry and Ron hid quickly behind a suit of armor next to the front door. How thick can you get, Ron whispered ecstatically as Crape gleefully pointed out the cakes to Goyle and grabbed them. Grinning stupidly, they stuffed the cakes whole into their large mouths. For a moment, both of them chewed greedily, looks of triumph on their faces. Then, without the smallest change of expression, they both keeled over backward onto the floor. By far, the hardest part was hiding them in the closet across the hall. Once they were safely stowed among the buckets and mops, Harry yanked out a couple of the bristles that covered Goyle's forehead, and Ron pulled out several of Crape's hairs. <coughs> they also stole their shoes because their own were far too small for Crape and Goyle's size feet. Then, still stunned at what they had just done, they sprinted up to Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. They could hardly see uh, for the sick uh, for the thick black smoke uh, issuing uh, issuing from the stall in which Hermione was storing the cauldron. Pulling their robes up over their faces, Harry and Ron knocked softly on the door. Hermione, they heard the uh, scrape of the lock and Hermione emerged, shiny faced and looking anxious. Behind her, they heard the glop glop of the bubbling glutinous potion. Three glass timbl tumblers stood ready on the toilet seat. Did you get them, Hermione asked breathlessly. Harry showed her Goyle's hair. Good, and I sneaked these spare robes out of the laundry, Hermione said, holding up a small sack. You'll need bigger sizes once you're crepe and goyle. The three of them stared into the cauldron. Close up, the potion looked like thick, dark mud, bubbling slushingly. I'm sure I've done everything right, said Hermione, nervously rereading the splotched patch, uh, page of uh, most potent potions. It looks like the book says it should. Once we've drunk it, we'll have exactly an hour before we change back into ourselves. Now what, Ron whispered. We separate into three glasses and add the hairs. Hermione ladled large dollops of the potion into each of the glasses. Then, her hand trembling, she took Millicent Bolstrode's hair out of its bottle and poured it into the first glass. The potion hissed loudly like a boiling kettle and frothed madly. A second later, it had turned a sick sort of yellow. Erg, essence of Millicent Bolstrode, said Ron, eyeing it with loathing. Bet it tastes disgusting. Add yours then, said Hermione. Harry dropped Goyle's hair into the middle glass and Ron put crepes into the last one. Both glasses hissed and frothed. Goyle's turned the khaki color of a booger, crepes a dark mucky brown. Hang on, said Harry, as Ron and Hermione reached for their glasses. We'd better not drink them in here. Once we turn into crepe and joyle, we won't fit. And uh, add Millicent Bulstrode's no pixie. Good thinking, said Ron, unlocking the door. We'll take separate stalls. Careful not to spill a drop of his polyjuice potion, Harry slipped into the middle stall. Ready, he called. Ready, came Ron and Hermione's voices. One, two, three. Pinching his nose, Harry drank the potion down into two large gulps. It tasted like overcooked cabbage. Immediately, his insides started withering as though he just swallowed live snakes. Doubled up, he wondered whether he was going to be sick. Then a burning sensation spread rapidly from his stomach to the very ends of his fingers and toes. Next, bringing him gasping to all fours, came a horrible melting feeling as the skin all over his body bubbled like hot wax. And before his eyes, his hands began to grow, the fingers thickened, the nails broadened, the knuckles were burgeoning like bolts, 
his shoulder stretched painfully and a prickling on his forehead told him that hair was creeping down toward his eyebrows. His robes ripped at his chest as his chest expanded like a barrel bursting its hoops. His feet uh, were, a were agony in, sho in shoes four sizes too small. As soon as it had started, everything stopped. Harry lay face down on the stone cold floor, listening to Myrtle gurgling more, more obviously at the end of the toilet. With difficulty, he kicked off his shoes and stood up. So this was what it felt like being Goyle, his large hand trembling. He pulled off his old robes, which were hanging a foot above his ankle, pulled on the spare ones and laced up Goyle's boat-like shoes. He reached up to brush his hair out of his eyes and met only the short, growth of wiry bristles low on his forehead. Then he realized that his glasses were clouding his eyes because Goyle obviously didn't need them. He took them off and called, are you two okay? Goyle's low rasp of a voice issued from his mouth. Yeah, came the deep grunt of crepes from his right. Harry unlocked his door and stepped in front of the cracked mirror. Goyle stared back at him out of dull, deepest eyes. Harry scratched his ear, so did Goyle. Ron's door opened. They stared at each other, except that he looked pale and shocked. Ron was indistinguishable from crepe, from the putting bowl haircut to the long gorilla arms. This is unbelievable, said Ron, approaching the mirror and proting crepe's flat nose. Unbelievable. We better get going, said Harry, loosening the watch, which was cutting into Goyle's thick wrist. We've still got to find out where the Slytherin common room is. I only hope we can find someone to follow. Ron, who had been gazing at Harry, said, you don't know how bizarre it is to see Goyle thinking. He banged on Hermione's door. Come on, we need to go. A high-pitched voice answered him. I, I don't think I'm going to come after all. You go on without me. Hermione, we know Mills and Bolstreet's ugly. No one's going to know it's you. No, really, I don't think I'll come. You two hurry up. You're wasting time. Harry looked at Ron bewildered. That that looks more like Goyle, said Ron. That's how he looks every time a teacher asks him a question. Hermione, are you okay, said Ron, uh, said Harry through the door. Fine, I'm fine, go on. Harry looked at his watch. Five of their precious 60 minutes had already passed. We'll meet you back here, all right, he said. Harry and Ron opened the door of the bathroom carefully, checked the coast was clear, and set off. Don't swing your arms like that, Harry muttered to Ron. Ugh, crepe holds them sort of stiff. How's this? Yeah, that's better. They went down the marble staircase. All they needed now was a Slytherin that they could follow to the Slytherin common room, but there was nobody around. Any ideas, muttered Harry. The Slytherins always come up from breakfast from over there, said Ron, nodding at the entrance to the dungeons. The words had barely left his mouth when a girl with long curly hair emerged from the entrance. Excuse me, said Ron, hurrying up to her. We've forgotten the way to our common room. I beg your par pardon, said the girl stiffly. Our common room? I'm a Ravenclaw. She walked away, looking suspiciously back at them. Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness, their footsteps echoing particularly loud as Crepe and Goyle's huge feet hit the floor, feeling that this wasn't going to be as easy as they had hoped. The labyrinth and passages were de deserted. They walked deeper and deeper under the school, constantly checking their watches to see how much time they had left. After a quarter of an hour, just when they were getting desperate, they heard a sudden movement ahead. Ha, huh, said Ron excitedly, there's one of them now. The figure was emerging from a side of the room. As they hurried nearer, however, their hearts sank. It wasn't a Slytherin, it was Percy. What are you doing down here, said Ron in surprise. Percy looked affronted. That, he said stiffly, is none of your business. It's crepe, isn't it? Why, oh yeah, said Ron. Well, get off to your dormitory, said Percy sternly. It's not safe to go wandering around dark, dark corridors these days. You are, Ron pointed out. I, said Percy, drawing himself up, am a perfect. Nothing's about to attack me. A voice suddenly echoed behind Harry and Ron. Draco Malfoy was strolling toward them, and for the first time in his life, Harry was pleased to see him. There you are, he drawled, looking at them. Have you two been pigging out in the Great Hall all this time? I've been looking for you. I want to show you something really funny. Malfoy glanced witheringly at Percy. And what uh, you're doing down here, Weasley, he sneered. 
Percy looked outraged. You want to show a bit more respect to a school perfect, he said. I don't like your attitude. Malfoy sneered and motioned for Harry and Ron to follow him. Harry almost said something apologetic to Percy, but caught himself just in time. He and Ron hurried after Malfoy, who said, who said as they turned into the next passage that Peter, that Peter Weasley, Percy, Ron corrected him automatically. Whatever, said Malfoy. I've noticed him sneaking around a lot lately, and I bet I know what he's up to. He's thinking he's going to catch Slytherin's heir single-handed. He gave a short desire, uh, deserve a deserve laugh. Harry and Ron exchanged excited looks. Malfoy paused by a stretch of bare, damp stone wall. What's the new password again, he said to Harry. Er, said Harry. Oh, yeah, pure blood, said Malfoy, not listening, and a stone door concealed in, uh, concealed in the wall slid open. Malfoy marched through it and Harry and Ron followed him. The Slytherin common room was long, low, underground room with rough stone walls and ceiling from which round greenish lamps were hanging on chairs. A fire was crackling under an elaborative curved mantelpiece ahead of them and several Slytherin were uh, silhou silhouetted around in high back chairs. We here, said Malfoy uh, to Harry and Ron, motioning them to a pair of empty chairs set back by the fire. I'll go and get it. My father's just sent it to me. Wondering what Malfoy was going to show them, Harry and Ron sat down doing their best to look at home. Malfoy came back a minute later holding what looked like a newspaper clipping. He, thirst, he thrust it under Ron's nose. That'll give you a laugh, he said. Harry saw Ron's eyes widen in shock. He read the clipping quickly gave a forced laugh and handed it to Harry. It had been clipped out of the Daily Prophet and it said, inquiry at the Ministry of Magic. Arthur Weasley, head of the Misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office was today fined 50 galleons for bewitching of a muggle car. Mr. Lucius Malfoy, a governor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry where the enchanted car crashed early this year called today for Mr. Weasley's resignation. Weasley has brought the ministry into dispute, into uh, disrespect, Mr. Malfoy told our reporter. He is clearly unfit to draw up our laws and his ridiculous muggle protection act should be scrapped immediately. Mr. Weasley was un unavailable for comment, although his wife told reporters to clear off and she'd set the family goal on them. Well, said Malfoy impatiently as Harry handed the clipping back to him, don't you think it's funny? Ha ha, said Harry bleakly. Arthur Weasley loves muggles so much he should snap his wand in half and go and join them, said Malfoy scornfully. You'd never know the Weasleys were pure blood the way they behave. Ron's, or rather, Crape's face was contorted with fury. What's up with you, Crape, snapped Malfoy. Stomachache, Ron grunted. Well, go up to the hospital wing and give all those mudbloods a kick for me, said Malfoy snickering. You know I'm surprised the Daily Prophet hasn't recorded all of these attacks yet. He went on thoughtfully. I suppose Dumbledore is trying to hush it all up. He'll be sacked if he doesn't stop soon. Father's always said old Dumbledore is the worst thing that's ever happened to this place. He loves Muggleborns. A decent headmaster would have never let slime like that creepy in. Malfoy started taking pictures with an imaginary camera and did a cruel but accurate impression of Colin. Potter, can I have your picture? Potter, can I have your autograph? Can I lick your shoes? Potter, please. He dropped his hands and looked at Harry and Ron. What's the matter with you two? Far too late, Harry and Ron forced themselves to laugh, but Malfoy seemed satisfied. Perhaps Crape and Goyle were always slow on the uptake. St. Potter of the Mud Bloods, friend, said Malfoy slowly. He's another one with no proper wizard feeling, or he wouldn't go around with that jumped up Granger mud blood. And people like he and people think he's Slytherin heir. Harry and Ron waited with batted breath. Malfoy was surely seconds away from telling them it was him. But then, I wish I knew who it was, said Malfoy. I could help them. Ron's jaw dropped so that Crape looked even more clueless than usual. Fortunately, Malfoy didn't notice. And Harry, thinking fast, said, you must have some idea who's behind it all. You know I haven't, Goyle. How many times do I have to tell you, snapped Malfoy. And father won't tell me anything about the last time the chamber was opened either. 
Of course, it was 50 years ago, so it was before his time, but he knows all about it. And he says that it was all kept quiet and it'll look suspicious if I know too much about it. But I know one thing, the last time the Chamber of Secrets was open, a mud blood died. So I bet it's a matter of time before one of them's killed this time. I hope it's Granger, he said with relish. Ron was clenching Crepe's gigantic fists, feeling that it would be a bit of a giveaway if Ron punched Malfoy. Harry shot him a wearing, warning look and said, do you know if the person who opened the chamber last time was caught? Oh yeah, whoever it was was expelled, said Malfoy. They're probably still in Azkaban. Azkaban, said Harry, puzzled. Azkaban, the wizard prison, Goyle, said Malfoy, looking at him in disbelief. Honestly, if you were any slower, you'd be going backward. He shifted restlessly in his chair and said, father says to keep my head down and let the air of Slytherin get on with it. He says the school needs ridding of all the mud blood filth, but not to get mixed up in it. Of course, he's got on his plate. He's got a lot on his plate at the moment. You know, the Ministry of Magic raided our manor last week. Harry tried to force Goyle's dull face into a look of concern. Yeah, said Malfoy. Luckily, they didn't find much. Father's got some very valuable dark art stuff, but luckily we've got our own secret chamber under the drawing room floor. Ho, oh, said Ron. Malfoy looked at him. So did Harry. Ron blushed. Even his hair was turning red. His nose was also slowly lengthening. Their hour was up. Ron was turning back into himself, and from the look of horror he was suddenly giving Harry, he must be too. They both jumped to their feet. Medicine for my stomach, Ron grunted, and without further ado, they sprinted the length of the Slytherin common room, hurled themselves at the stone wall, and dashed up the passage, hoping against hope that Malfoy hadn't noticed anything. Harry could feel his feet slipping around in Goyle's huge shoes and had to hoist up his robes as he shrank. They crashed up the steps into the dark entrance hall, which was full of a muffled pounding coming from the closet where they'd locked Crepe and Goyle. Leaving their shoes outside the closet door, they sprinted in their socks up the staircase where, uh, toward Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Well, it wasn't a complete waste of time, Ron panted, closing the bathroom door behind them. I know we still haven't found out who's doing the attacks, but I'm going to write to dad tomorrow and tell him to check under the Malfoy's drawing room. Harry checked his face in the cracked mirror. He was back to normal. He put his glasses on as Ron hammered on the door of Hermione's stall. Hermione, come out. We've got loads to tell you. Go away, Hermione squeaked. Harry and Ron looked at each other. What's the matter, said Ron. You must be back to normal now. We are. But moaning Myrtle glided suddenly through the stall door. Harry had never seen her look so happy. Oh, wait till you see, she said. It's awful. They heard the lock slide back and Hermione emerged, sobbing, her robes pulled up over her head. What's up, said Ron uncertainly. Have you still got Millicent's nose or something? Hermione let her robes fall and Ron backed into the sink. Her face was covered in black fur, her eyes had turned yellow, and there were long pointed ears poking through her hair. It was a cat hair, she howled. Millicent Broadstro must have a cat and the potion isn't supposed to be used for animal transformations. Uh-oh, said Ron. You'll be teased something dreadful, said Myrtle happily. It's okay, Hermione, said Ron quickly. We'll take you up to the hospital wing. Madam Pumphrey knows, uh, Madam Pumphrey never asked too many questions. It took a long time to persuade Hermione to leave the bathroom. Moaning Myrtle sped them on their way with a hearty gruff Wait till everyone finds out you've got a tail. Oh my goodness. That's where we're going to stop for today because chapter 13 is far too long. So we'll read that next week. So interesting what they found out. So much more to still find out what's going on with this chamber. Who's going to get hurt? Who's not going to get hurt? Who is the true heir? Can't wait to keep reading with you guys next week. In the meantime, please be safe. Please be kind. And please stay nice and hydrated. I'll see you guys real soon. Bo Duke and Hobie say goodbye. Bo and Hobie say goodbye. Bye, everyone.